Now that we know how to work with errors, and now that we learned a lot about Node Express in general, let me dive into a little more advanced or specialized topic, file uploads and downloads. Now, it's actually not something that rare. You'll often have a feature like this on your web page, and therefore it is important to understand how you can allow your users to upload files and how you can handle that on your server side and which different possibilities you have for returning files to your users. So this is essentially what we'll dive into in this module. We'll have a look at how to upload files and most importantly, how to handle them on the server. And of course, we'll then have a look at the different options you have for returning files. So let's dive in. Now let's start with uploading files. And there we have a really great use case. And that of course is that when we add a new product, we right now always have to enter a URL. That is not a very realistic setup because in a real world application, your users who are trying to sell things will probably not have pictures of their products stored somewhere in the web. So we definitely want to give our users the possibility of uploading images. And that is exactly what I'll work on now. Adding file upload means that we have to do two things. The first thing is that we need to adjust our form here to show a file picker to our users. So a tool which they can use to, well, select a file on their operating system on their computer. And then the second part is that we need to be able to accept that file in the place where we, well, handle it, where we handle the incoming request. Now, let's start with the form and let's add a file picker there. So we'll dive into our views and there it's in the admin section, the edit product EJS file. There we will have our image URL control, this one, and in the end, this image URL should now become a file picker. For that, I'll copy this old block and comment it out so that we still have it around in case we need it later. But this will now become a new image uploader. There I'll just have image as a label. Now that class here where I try to mark this as invalid, I'll remove that because we'll not have an input where we would add a red border around. Um, the type here will be changed to file, the name I'll change that to image and I'll change the ID to image too, uh, also up here therefore. And now the value with which I'll pre-populate this, I'll remove that because even if we're editing this, I will always present an empty file picker and we'll just have to tweak our backend logic later so that when we're editing this and we're not sending a new file, we simply keep the old one and we overwrite the old one if we do send a new one. But for now, I'll simply set up my file input like this. Now, if I save that and I reload this page, now we have our file picker here, which is a default HTML element. And if we click it, we can select a file like this boat here. You can pick any file. It should be an image, of course. So now I have chosen that and now if I would enter the rest and add this product, we would fail because right now we got no logic in place to handle an incoming file, to store it or to do anything with it. And this is the part we'll have to adjust now. So in the next lecture, I want to make sure that we can handle incoming files just as well as incoming text, which we previously always accepted. So now that we added our file picker, let's work on the back end. And for that, I'll go to my admin controller, which is where I do handle uh, the creation of products. Also the editing of products, which we'll work on later. But for now, let's focus on adding a product. And here we are extracting data from the incoming request. Now I renamed my file picker here to image. So the input name is now just image. And this means that here, when I try to retrieve it from the body, I should also target the image like this. Or we can uh, keep this name because it will fail anyways. If I now submit this like that, I click add product, I get invalid value here and the image URL does fail because I do have in my routes, in the admin routes, I do have some validation place where I say the image URL should be a URL. 
and clearly it is not. So let's remove validator here for the post add product route and let's try this again. And now we simply get an error. So the error handling is working and the error we're getting is simply stemming from the fact that we're not able to extract our image correctly. I can show this to you. If I console log image URL here in post add product in this controller action and I try to submit this, then you don't see anything here. It fails to log anything there because we fail to extract an image from the request body. And why is that? Because keep in mind, you learned this a little bit earlier in this course, for extracting the content of our incoming requests, we set up a middleware in app.js. We're using a special middleware, this body parser middleware. And this middleware uses or exposes a couple of different parsers and we're using the URL encoded parser. Now, URL encoded data is basically text data. So if a form is submitted without a file, so just with text fields, no matter if that text field then stores a number, a URL or plain text, but it's all encoded in text when it is submitted. This format is then called URL encoded. And actually we can see that if we open the developer tools and go to the network tab in there, if I do click submit here, this failing request, this add product request, if we have a look at our request headers, we can see that the content type is application and then xwww form URL encoded. And this basically means it tries to put all the data as text into its form body. We can see that down there, this form data, title, price and so on, and just image, this is invalid. This is basically an empty text because it can't extract our file as text because a file is binary data. Now, because of that, because of that failing uh, extraction, we need to work with this differently. We need to parse our data differently. And the body parser we're using here does not give us any parser, it does not include any parser that could handle file data as well. We need a new package for that. So let me quit that server and let's install a new package with npm install dash dash save. And the name of that package is Malter. Malter is another third party package that parses incoming requests, but this package parses incoming requests for files. So it is able to handle file requests as well, or requests with mixed data, with text and file data. We'll still keep body parser because we still have like, for example, our sign up form where we only submit URL encoded data, but now we'll have to use a different encoding. And that starts with our form. So back in the view, the added product view, there, I'll change my form here a little bit. Besides the class and action, here I'll also add a new field, and that's the enc type field, which I'll set to multi part form data. Application xwww form URL encoded is the default, but now we'll switch to multi part form data, which is simply the content type telling the server that this submission, that this request will not contain plain text, but will contain mixed data, text and binary data. And Malter, the package we just installed, will be looking for incoming requests with this type of data and will then be able to parse both the text and our um, file. So this is what we get there or what we uh, will need. And now with all that prepared, let's use Malter in the next lecture. So let's use Malter now on our backend. We can restart the server already because we installed that package. And now let's go to our admin controller and let's work on post add product here. We want to use Malter to extract incoming files. Now Malter is actually not a package which we will use in here. Instead, just like the body parser we use here, Malter is some middleware, which we execute on every incoming request. And it then simply has a look at that request, sees if it's multi-part form data and tries to extract files if that is the case. So it is some extra middleware we add. 
And therefore, we can import it here in our app.js file. We can import Malter by requiring it from the package like this, Malter. And thereafter, we can use it. So maybe after the body parser, we can use Malter. Malter has to be executed as a function. And then we have to call another method on that. And that simply defines if you expect to get multiple files or only one file. And we will only expect one file. So we use the single method. And then we define the input name which will hold the file. And in our case, that is image. And this is not a random value. I'm choosing image here because in my view, this input which holds the file, so this file picker here is named image as well. So with that, we initialize Malter. And let's now see if that works. Now to see that we need to know how Malter will actually store the incoming file. And for that, let me go back to post add product. And instead of extracting request body image, let me access request file here. Let's see what this gives us. I will also console log image URL now. Now let's save all that and see what that gives us. If I now try to add a product again, I'll choose that same file from before, enter any values up here, click add product, and I still get an error. Now if we go back, we see something interesting though. Indeed here, this part is what I log here. So here what we see is that Malter seems to have done something. It seems to have stored something in that file property on our request object. And that is what we print here essentially. And it stored the name of the field where it extracted that. It detected the file name. It detected the MIME type, so which type of file that is. And that buffer here is essentially how Node handles the binary data. You learned about streams and buffers earlier. In the end, this is the result of the streamed data. The file basically was sent to our server as a stream or was handled as a stream to handle it efficiently if it was bigger. And then this is the collected data in a buffer, which as you learned is like a bus stop. It gives you a way of working with the stream data. Here in this case, it's the combined streamed in data. And we could indeed work with that buffer to turn it um, into a file. Now you can actually configure Malter a bit differently. We go back to app.js. When we set up Malter, we can pass an object to the Malter function. And there we can set some options. And one option is the dest option. Now here, we could specify slash images or just images like this. What this will do is that when I, again, add a product here, and don't worry that it still fails because we're trying to store the file in the database right now and we'll do uh, all kinds of stuff with it for which our code is not prepared, but the upload works. But with this option set, you also see that the output down there changed a little bit. We don't have the buffer because now Malter is able to do something with the buffer. Instead of just buffering it all in memory, it can then uh, turn that buffer back into binary data, you could say, and it stores it in this path here. So indeed, if you have a look at your folder, you should now have an images folder with some file in there. Now that file has some random hash name, does not have a file extension and is not recognized as an image. But indeed, if I change that and I add .png at the end, this is the image I uploaded. So this does work. All we now need to do is we need to tweak the way this file is named. And that is something we'll do in the next lecture. We added Malter and as we can see Malter is able to accept our incoming data, extract the files and store them for us and then store information about the file upload in this request file object here which we output which in the end contains this data. Now all we have to do is we have to ensure that our data gets stored correctly. And for that we specified the destination folder but we can do more. We can set the storage key here, which gives us way more configuration options than just the dest option. Now for that, to configure a storage here, I will actually set up a new configuration object, uh, maybe up there, file storage, the name is up to you. 
it's a constant and the value will be something I get from the multer package. There, it's the disk storage function. Disk storage is in the end a storage engine which you can use with multer and there you can pass a JavaScript object to configure that. It takes two keys, it takes the destination and it takes the file name. These are two functions which Malter will then call for an incoming file and these functions then control how that file is handled regarding the place where you store it and the regarding the naming. So destination therefore is a function, we can make it an arrow function which will be called by Malter, which receives the request object, the file object and a callback which you have to call once you're done setting up the destination. So this is all to interact with Malter. So in there, you can, for example, call the callback with null as the first argument. That would be an error message you throw to inform Malter that something is wrong with the incoming file and it should not store it. But if that is null, you tell Malter that it's okay to store it. And then the second argument is the place where you do want to store it, like that images folder. Now, file name also is a function, so it's also an arrow function where we all receive the request object, some data about the file and a callback which we have to call to let Malter know how to name it. And there we can also call this with null to still inform Malter. Okay, we're fine, store it please. And then the second argument is the file name which we want to use. And here we could name it image PNG, but of course that would be a bit boring. Instead, we can extract file and then there is a original name object which holds the original file name there also is a file name object which holds this random hash. In the end, what we can do here is we can of course combine this. We can for example say, I want to ensure that if we have two images with the same name, they don't overwrite each other. So I will use that file name which is auto-generated by Malter and then I'll concatenate it, maybe with a dash in between, with the original name. With that, I also ensure that I end with that extension. And now I set my own file name here by calling that callback. Now we just need to inform Malter that we want to use this storage engine. And we do this by setting this as a value for the storage key in the Malter options. Now with that, if I go back and I add my product again, so the same input, both PNG selected, you will see that in this images folder, you now have undefined both PNG now it's simply undefined here instead of that random hash because since we did set our own file name with this function here, Malter does not auto-generate that hash. But what we can do for example is we can use the current date. So new date to isostring gives us a snapshot of the current date and that should also ensure uniqueness. If you need more, you can use some third party package that does give you a truly unique hash. But with this, we're now storing files with the right extension and a unique name. And this gives us more power because now we can control the path and the file name. And of course, we can also use it for even more because maybe we want to validate that we only support certain MIME types. Let's say PNGs and JPEGs, but not GIFs or PDFs. Let's do that in the next lecture. Now we added our Malter configuration to rename our file and to uh, control the storage place in detail. Now we can also add a filter to Malter to only allow certain kinds of files. And for that, to the object where we configure Malter, I can add the file filter function here. Now I'll again create this in a separate constant up there to make it easier to read. File filter will simply be a function I'll use an arrow function here where I get the request, some file data and a callback which I have to call. And in there, we should call the callback with null as an error and true if we want to accept that file, so if it should be stored, or false if we don't want to store that file. Now how can we determine whether we want to store it? Well, we can write any logic we want here. And I will check if the file mime type is equal to image slash png or if the file mime type is equal to image jpeg or if the file mime type is equal to image jpeg with an e. If any of that is true, so if I have a file which is of that type, then 
I will accept it. So we'll call the callback with true as a second value. Otherwise, I'll call the callback with false as a second value, which means I'll not accept that file. And now we can use that file filter and pass it as a value for file filter in our options here. And with that set up, we got some logic here that should filter out invalid files. So if I go back now and I submit a form here with, let's say, my boat PNG, I succeed here. Well, I get an error here, but I succeed because it stores the file. But if I try to submit a different value, let's say I'll pick a PDF here. You can use any PDF, any non-image file. Then you see I only get undefined here and that undefined is stemming from my admin controller from this line. So then Malter did not store anything. And this is how we can filter out files. Now I will remove all these files up there and I'll also clean up my database soon because right now we're not really storing the data appropriately. And that is the next step we should do, of course. So I'll just quickly clean up all my products here because they're all stored in an incorrect way um, due to, well, how I worked with the files in the past. So let me remove all these products. And now let me go back and here in my application in post add product, so in my admin controller, there I now want to handle that file correctly. So first of all, image here will be an object of this format with information about the file and where it was stored, so where the physical file can be found. And now I want to save that. First of all, I will check if image is set because if it's undefined, then that means that Malter declined the incoming file. So if this is not set, if it is undefined, well then I want to return a response with status 422 because I then have an invalid input. So I want to return that response, add product, editing false has errors true, where I pass in my old data, not the file however, only title, price and description. And the error message is attached file is not an image, let's say. And validation errors can be an empty error array. I won't mark anything as red. With this change in place, we can already validate this. If I now try to upload an image, I succeed, so I don't get my same form again. If I choose a PDF though, then I get attached files, not an image. So this is working. And let's now also work on the case that we do have an image and that we want to store it. Now, the file already gets stored in, on our file system. And this is how you should store it. You should not store data like this in the database. Files should not be stored in a database. They're too big. It's too inefficient to store them in a database and query them from there. Store files on a file system as we are doing it here. But of course, you need to store something in a database. You need to store the path to the file, right? And that is something you can construct here with the information given to you in the file object. And you can then simply pass that data to the database. So if we made it after our entire validation here, I know that I have a valid file and valid input data. And then I'll create my image URL again. And in that image URL, I will use my image data, which is that file object we get from Malter. And there we have information like the file path. And it's this path that is interesting to me, of course, because this is the path to the file on my operating system. It is the path I therefore want to use later on when fetching that image. So this path is what I'll store here in the image URL. And therefore I can store image URL in the database again. So if we now save all of that, and I do select a valid image here and I hit add product, this now works again. Displaying it does not work. We'll work on this in a second. But saving does work. If I have a look into my database for the products, you see this is the path that was stored. Now this is looking good. But of course here, if we inspect this, we see the image is not really rendered because it can't find this. It fails to fetch images and then, well, this name. And in the network tab, we indeed find a 404 error when the browser sends the request for this image. So now that we are able to store data, let's also learn how we can serve data. Well, almost before we serve it, let's work on editing this because this is another part which won't work correctly right now. 
Right now, when we load the edit page, what we do is we load the page and we send back the data we need for displaying it, of course. So that means we render the added product page with product data. And that includes our image URL, which is of course fine. But ultimately, here we don't see the URL and we don't want to change the URL when editing the product. Instead here, we have a new file picker. Now, you can of course configure this to work in any way you want. But here I want to have a behavior where if we choose no file here, we simply keep the old one and we only overwrite it with a new file if I do choose a new one here. So to do that, I'll go to post edit product, which is where we do handle the incoming data. And of course here, we again can retrieve request file and store that in a image constant, just as I'm doing it here when we add the product. There I'm also retrieving this file extracted by Malter. Malter will do the same for a post edit product, so I can extract it there too, store it in image. And now this image is the thing I need to check. If it is undefined, then I know no file was saved. And in this case, this means I want to keep the old file. By the way, the same will be true if I upload a PDF. I will simply keep the old image in that case. So we don't need to throw an error or return an error message, though you could of course do that if you want, if you always want to force a new image. But here what I'll do is instead, I'll first of all edit my validation page which I return and I'll not return the image URL here. We don't need that, just as in po post add product, there we also don't need to return that because there is no image URL we render in our edit page anymore. But if we make it past our validation here, when we store the product or when we update the product, I should say, this image URL does not exist anymore. Instead here, I want to see if I really need to set that. So I'll check if image is there, if it's not undefined, in which case I'll set product image URL to image path. So the same logic as I do have it in post add product, there I also set image URL to image path. But in post edit product, I do it conditionally and if the image is undefined, so if no new image was passed, I simply don't set it on the object which I then update. And since I update it and if I don't set this, I will simply, well, not update this field. And I can prove this to you. If I update this product here now, I get an invalid value because I forgot to adjust my um, validation middleware in the routes folder for editing the product. I'm still checking for image URL to be a URL, but this field does not exist anymore. So we should remove that from the added product route validation logic. And now if I submit this again, it just works. If I now choose a different image though, and before I select this, let me quickly show you. If I update my database here, you see that image URL did not change. If I select both two now, which is the same image but a different file name and technically a different file therefore, I update this and now if we go to the database and we refresh, we see it set both two. So now we got that editing option in place too and now we do handle the file uploads in the way we need to handle them. But of course handling file uploads is only one thing. We also want to be able to see that image, so to download it, kind of. And that is what I'll focus on in the next lectures. So how can we ensure that all our beautiful images are also served to the client, that they are downloaded? We got multiple options for serving files and I will walk you through all of them. Now. Option number one, which you would typically use for a scenario like this, where you have files that are publicly available to everyone, like our product images, is that we simply serve our images folder in a static way. What does this mean? This means we go to app.js and there we already are statically serving a folder. We are serving the public folder with the express static middleware. Now we can serve more than one folder statically. And remember, statically serving a folder simply means that requests to files in that folder will be handled automatically and the files will be returned. So all the heavy lifting is done behind the scenes by Express then. I can duplicate this middleware and now also serve the images folder just like this. And with this little change, if I save that and the server therefore restarts, if we reload this page, 
we still fail. Well, if we inspect that failing request, we see that it tried to get the image from admin slash images. The reason for that is that I'm on the admin route here, admin products to be precise. So it's only replacing the last part of my path with that uh, image URL. And the solution for that is pretty straightforward. In our view, products EJS, where I do show my image, we simply need to add a slash at the beginning, which will turn this into an absolute path, so it will not append it to the current path, but rather uh, create a new path with only our domain and then the path which gets rendered here. And I do this in products and of course also on my shop pages. So on index EJS. So basically everywhere where I do render an image, I add a slash at the beginning. The alternative would be to store that path in a database with a slash at the beginning, of course. Might have been easier, but I want to show you both ways. So here I'll add it in my views. Also here in the product list EJS file. Like this, and also in the product detail file, of course. There we also have an image. If we change all of that, and I now reload this page, I still fail. And now the reason for that is something different. The reason for that is that the path now is correct, but my images here in the images folder are served incorrectly. In AppJS, where I set up this static middleware, keep in mind uh, what I taught you earlier in this course. We basically point to a folder there, like public and images, and we then tell Express serve the files from inside that folder as if they were on the root folder. So we would see that image if we go there and we see the path under which it tried to find that. If we open that in a new tab, we can't find it, of course. But we will see it if I remove images there. And the reason for that is that Express assumes that the files in the images folder are served as if they were in the root folder, so slash nothing. Of course, we want to keep them in the images folder and keep the path like this. And for this, we can simply adjust our middleware here and say if we have a request that goes to slash images, that starts with slash images, then serve these files statically. And now, slash images is the folder we assume for this static serving. And now with that, if we save that and we reload, we see our image here. So now we got that working and now we got a static way of serving our files. And that is a great way of serving them. Now I want to do something different though. I want to add this to the cart, order it so that I have an order and I want to download an invoice for that order. And that will now work differently because invoices will not be public files that everyone should be able to access. I want to be able to access my invoice, but no one else should be. So let's focus on this in the next lectures. So serving images statically is fine, but we don't want to serve only images or only public files. I want to serve an invoice and that invoice should only be available to me. Now for that, let's start with a dummy invoice and I'll create a new folder for that. I'll name it invoices. You could of course put all images and invoices and so on into a, a parent folder like data to not have them all as root level folders. Um, that might be something you wanna do. I'll move the invoices in there. Images is kind of like a special case, but my private data should be maybe somewhere else. So I'll put it into the data folder, which was redundant until now. Now it's not anymore. And I prepared a simple PDF, which I'll move in there. Now this is a really simple PDF. Um, you can write it uh, on your own. It's just holding some text looking like this. So here is my invoice. That is the PDF file. I'm serving now. Later we'll also generate this dynamically. Now we won't. Now I just want to show you how to serve that. Now obviously we could make our invoices folder here statically accessible, but that's not what I want to do. Now first of all let me work on the orders view to make sure we have a link to get that invoice. So for each order, this list item here which we have, let's maybe add a dash in the list item and in there let's add an anchor tag which says invoice and that then it should be pointing at the invoice. So now if I reload this page, 
we have invoice here as a link. Now I want to be able to click this and download the invoice. How can we do that? Well, since I want to handle this privately, I need to set up my own route for working with invoices because that will then allow me to check for things like is the user authenticated and so on. So let me go to the routes folder and in there under shop because this is a customer uh, feature not admin related. Under shop here I'll add a new route orders and then maybe invoice ID or order ID maybe because the, the invoice let's say will have a name of that um, order ID ultimately. We could name this file differently, we could name it invoice and then let me quickly up look up my order ID to make this all work correctly. Got a bunch of orders in there but this is my um, latest order, order which I just placed. So let's grab that text ID here and, and add that to the invoice name here. Maybe after a dash we have the order ID, something like this. So this is my invoice and I'm getting the order ID in this route. I should be protected, uh, authenticated to see that so I'll protect this route and then I'll use my shop controller and there I get invoice controller action which I have yet to add. So that's why it crashed here because I don't have that action yet. In the shop controller, at the bottom maybe, let's export get invoice here and that will be our default middleware function with request, response and next. And in here I now want to return that file. First of all I need the invoice ID for that. Uh, the order ID, excuse me, order ID will be request and then it's encoded in the URL so it's params and then order ID. That is what I specified here in my routes file. Order ID, that's the name and therefore I have to retrieve it by that name in my controller. So order ID here. Now I have that order ID. The file name or the, the invoice name will be looking there for will be invoice dash and then my order ID and then dot PDF, right? That is the format in which all our invoices are stored, let's say. So now we need to retrieve that file. And we can retrieve files with Node's file system. We used that before in the course already. So let's start using it again. Let's import it. File system by requiring file system. This is a core no Node module, if you remember. You don't need to install a package. It's already included in Node. And the file system allows us to do things like read files, which sounds like a thing that makes sense here. So let's use the file system and read a file. We know it will be found in the data folder. Now the path here should be constructed with the path core module so that it works on all operating systems. So let's also import path by requiring path, another core node module, the path module. And let's construct that path to the invoice. So here I'll have my invoice uh, path and I'll create it with path join and I'll be looking for the data folder, that the, that's the first element, then the invoices folder and then the invoice name, the file name. So this is the path which I want to read. So I'll pass that invoice path to read file. Read file then gives me a callback, so a function which it will execute once it's done reading that file. So here I will either get an error or the data. Now data will be in the format of a buffer. Now of course we should check if we have an error and if that is the case well then we simply next it so that the default error handling function can take over. Otherwise if we don't have an error, um, here I'll return by the way so that the other code won't execute, so if we don't have an error then data should be my, my file, right? So then I can call res send, which is a function provided by the express middleware, my data. Now theoretically that should be the file. Now let's see if that works and to make it work we have to use this route in our anchor tag. So in orders EJS in this anchor tag we'll be looking for slash orders 
slash. And now we need to output something dynamic with EJS, and that is the order ID, because that's what we're looking for in the route. So the order ID is simply order underscore ID, which we use up there already. So let's output that here. Let's save that and reload that page. And now let's, let's click this invoice here. And I do get my download option here. Let me save that and try to open that file. And indeed, it should open as a PDF or you should be able to open it as a PDF. But of course, it was not the most convenient way of downloading this. We had a strange file name, right? This strange cryptic name. We don't have the PDF extension and all of that. So we can certainly improve that. Let's do that in the next lecture. We have our code for downloading a file. And this file is now only available if we are logged in. Now we can improve the way we return this, however. We can pass some extra information to the browser so that it uses a different file name and also the right extension. For this, we'll set some headers. So we can use set header for that. And first of all, we can set the content type to application slash PDF because that is what it is here. Whoops, like this. Let's see what this does. If I save it like that, and I now click this button. Now I open it in the browser. So this already changes the behavior. It already gives the browser some information which allows the browser to handle this in a better way. And for PDFs, most browsers simply open them in line, so in the browser. So that's great, but we can pass more information. We can also set another header, and that is the content dash disposition. This allows us to define how this content should be served to the client. We can set this to inline to still tell the browser to open it inline, for example. So if I change it like this, nothing changes. But we can also, for example, add a file name here. So we can add semicolon and then file name and set this equal to, in double quotation marks, the file name you want to serve. So in my case, it would be the invoice name, right? So we can also set file name equal to, double quotation marks, plus invoice name, plus closing double quotation mark contained between single quotation marks. If I now save this, and I click this button, now we don't see a difference with the file name when opening it inline, because it's open in the browser anyways, but we can change inline to attachment, for example. Now with that adjusted, if we click on invoice, the download menu opens again. And now here we have the proper file name with the proper extension. And this is how you can control how the browser should handle the incoming data. Should it automatically open it? Should it instead let you download it? So I'll switch this back to inline, but keep the file name here. And now I have a setup where only authenticated users can request this invoice. We can still improve that. Now, how can we improve this serving of the data? Well, first of all, right now, this is only available to authenticated users because on my route here, I have the is of middleware, but every user could view that. I don't have to be the user who placed that order. However, for that order, I of course know which user belongs to it. I have the user ID here. So we can add an extra check in our middleware, uh, in our controller action here to see if for this order, the user is eligible of downloading it. Now, how do we do that? Well, we use the order mongoose model, find that order by that ID in the database, and then check if the order user ID is equal to the ID of the currently logged in user. So here I can check order and then find by ID and I pass in my order ID. I have then and catch here. Now, as you know, in here, we can simply next an error to use the default error handling function. And here we'll have our order element, though that could be undefined if no order for this ID is found. So if no order is found, then I will also return next with a new error maybe, no order found. Whatever you want, you can handle this differently. 
If we do have an order, however, I want to check if the order is from that user who's logged in. So then I can check if order user, and then keep in mind, in the user object, we have the user ID field. So if that user ID to string, if that is equal to request user underscore ID, so of the currently logged in user to string. If that is equal, I am allowed to access this. If it's not, so if I'm checking the opposite, if it's not equal, then I will return a new error unauthorized, something like this. And only if I make it past these two if checks, only in this case, I want to read that file and output it. So if I now save this and I access this, it works. If I change the three here to a two, I get my error because now it's an invalid URL. And if I copy that original URL, which was correct, and I do log out, and I try to access this whilst I'm logged out, I have to log in. And if I log in with a different user, or let me quickly create that user, and I then log in, and I now try to access this order, I also get an error. I have to be the correct user. Now, of course, you could show a different error message, but that is always something you can tweak. I only want to show you how you can protect this and that you have this option of controlling that access. So here, this all works just fine. So we added authorization to our download option here. Now that's not all we can improve. We can also improve the way we are serving that file. Because right now, I'm simply reading that file and once I read it, I return it. Now for small files, this is probably fine, but you should be aware of one important fact. If you read a file like this, Node will first of all access the file, read the entire content into memory, and then return it with the response. This means that for bigger files, this will take very long before a response is sent and your memory on the server might actually overflow at some point for many incoming requests because it has to read all the data into memory, which of course is limited. So reading file data into memory to serve it as a response is not really a good practice. For tiny files, it might be okay, but for bigger files, it certainly is not. Instead, you should be streaming your response data. And that is what I will do now. So I'll comment out this code where I read my file and instead here, I will now start streaming it. For that, I'll create a new constant. I'll name it file and I will use the file system and create a read stream because I wanna read some data in. Now I wanna read in data at a specific path and the path hasn't changed. It's the invoice path. So now I have that read stream and Node will be able to use that to read in the file step by step in different chunks. I will then take my response code here where I set the headers. I still do that on the response object. And then here I will use that file read stream and call the pipe method to forward the data that is read in with that stream to my response because the response object is a writable stream actually and you can use readable streams to pipe their output into a writable stream. Not every object is a writable stream, but the response happens to be one. So we can pipe our readable stream, the file stream, into the response. And that means that the response will be streamed to the browser and will contain the data and the data will basically be downloaded by the browser step by step. And for large files, this is a huge advantage because Node never has to preload all the data into memory, but just streams it to the client on the fly. And the most it has to store is one chunk of data. Again, we're back to the streams and the buffers. The chunks are what we work with. The buffers basically gives us access to these chunks. And here we don't wait for all the chunks to come together and concatenate them into one object. Instead, we forward them to the browser, which then is also able to concatenate the incoming data pieces into the final file. So with this setup here, let's try this again, click on orders, click on invoice. And again, we see the invoice as before, 
but now this is actually streamed data created with that create read stream thing, which is the recommended way of getting your file data, especially for bigger files. Now that we learned how to save files and how to return them in different ways, statically as one big file or as a streamed response, let me show you a little bonus, so to say, where we can create a PDF on the fly on the server. Instead of serving that hard-coded PDF here, let me create it on the fly instead. So I will delete my invoice here and instead when we get the invoice for an order, I don't want to serve a file that already exists, but I want to generate that file based on the real order data. For that, I first of all will still check if we have that order and if the user is allowed to access it. But of course, this will now change. Well, actually, the name will be the same and I will store it in the same way, but I now can't read the file. I need to create it. And how can we create a PDF? Well, there are third-party packages which we can use, which make it a lot easier. And PDF Kit is a very prominent or popular package for creating PDFs on a Node.js server. I strongly recommend checking out their documentation to learn more about all its many options because it's super powerful. It can do a lot of stuff. So definitely worth having a look at this. And we will use it to create a very simple PDF in this course here. Now, for the documentation, it's important to know that this documentation uses CoffeeScript, which is like a super set to JavaScript. It's not supported by Node. Uh, it's just a tooling for writing your code. It's compiled back to normal JavaScript. And therefore, this documentation can be a bit hard to read. In the end, you could say something like this new PDF document. Here we would have curly braces after it. Um, require would be using curly braces. So some stuff here looks a bit different, but I will show you how to use it in this module, in this lecture actually. Let's start by installing it. So I will simply run npm install dash dash save PDF kit. That's the name of the package. You also find these instructions on the official page, npm install PDF kit. And then we can start using it once it's installed. So let me start that server again. And up there in my shop.js controller file, I'll import PDF kit by requiring it. PDF kit. So this package we just installed. Actually, PDF kit exposes a PDF document constructor. So let's maybe name it like this. So PDF document. The name is up to you, but this is closer to what this package really exposes. Now I want to create a new PDF document when we get an invoice at this point here. So let's create a new PDF doc, whatever you want to name it, by calling new PDF document. And that's what I meant. You need to add normal parentheses as we always did for all constructors. So now we have a new PDF document. This actually also turns out to be a readable stream. Therefore, what we can do here is we can use the PDF document. And we can do two things. First of all, we pipe this output into a writable file stream. So create write stream as a function we can call on the file system package. And to that, we pass a path where we want to write it to, the invoice path in my case. And this ensures that the PDF we generate here also gets stored on the server and not just served to the client. So we create that. And of course, I also want to return it to the client. So I also pipe the output into my response, just as before. The response is a writable read stream. PDF doc is a readable one. So we can do that. Now we have this set up. And now whatever we add to the document will be forwarded into this file, which gets generated on the fly and into our response. Now let's start simple. And let's now use PDF doc and let's call the text method, which exists there. This allows us to add a single line of text into the PDF document. So here, let's add hello world, maybe. And then you have to call PDF doc to tell node when you're done writing to that stream, because you have to be done at some point, right? So here, you simply call end. And when you call end, these writable streams 
for creating the file and for sending the response will be closed, so to say, or will know that you're done writing and therefore the file will be saved and the response will be sent. And now with that saved, just make sure you all to change your setup down there at the bottom. I will keep the headers, but I will not pipe any file because we now, well, pipe the file up there when we create it. And I just need to make sure that I set my response headers accordingly. Now with that, if you save that and you click on that invoice link, you should get a PDF with hello world in there. And this PDF also can be found here. Now it might look a bit strange here, but you can open it with a normal PDF reader and it should look like a PDF. So this is how you can create a PDF on the fly. Now in the next lecture, let's actually populate it with some order data. So let's create a more useful PDF now. Now you can configure a lot and the official docs of PDF kit are the place to go to learn more about that. But let me show you how you can generate some nicely looking PDF in little time. For example, let's set a font size here of 26 and then add some text. And this text will now have this font size and this will have text of invoice. If I now save this and I reload this page, we get invoice written like this. We can also pass an object as a second argument here and configure this. For example, we can set underline to true here on the text. And now if I reload this, we have an underlined text. So of course you can style way more, you can even add images and all that stuff. Now I'm happy with that title. I'll simply add some dashes as the next line here. And then thereafter I want to have my different items. So now I have to loop for all the items that are part of the order. In this order, I only have one product, but I might have more products. And actually, we can of course do that. If I go to products, I can add this product to the cart twice. And I can quickly create a new product, prod2. And boring as I am, I'll use the same image for 29 bucks, product2. Let's quickly create that product. And then after we created it, I can add that to my cart as well. And then I can order this. And now I got a brand new order. Now, by the way, I should place that invoice link next to the order, not next to the product now that I have a look at it. But it doesn't matter, we can change this later. For now, this will always lead to the same invoice, so it does not matter too much. Now I have multiple products in there and I should loop through them when creating the output. So I can add a for loop or simply access, keep in mind, we already have access to the order here since we fetched it from the database. I can access order products and products is an array because we store this products array in the database. It will be an array of objects where each object has a quantity and then a product key with more detail information. So I can loop through my products, for example, with the for each method, which is a built in method provided by JavaScript. I'll then get information about my product and I can now output some text where I print the prod product, the standard detail object. And in that product, we have the title, for example. So I can output the title here. Then let's say we add a blank and a dash and a blank. And then I have prod quantity, right? Because we have the quantity key here directly on the product itself. And then I add, let's say a, a times character. And then we want to output the price. So I'll have, let's say a dollar sign. And then last but not least, I'll have the product price. So this field here. Now, of course, you could also use the next gen JavaScript syntax with backticks to make this a bit easier to read. Uh, I think it's maybe easier to understand how we are concatenating this from hard coded values and dynamic values. And now we should be outputting a line of data for each product in that order. Now let's also add a sum at the bottom. 
And we can calculate that on the fly here. Let total price starts at zero. And if we are looping for all the products anyways, we can use that to also update our total price because total price will then be the old total price plus the product quantity times the prod product price. So basically what we print here as text will then also add it to our total price here. By the way, this can be written in a shortcut with this operator. Now this will always add the result of this calculation to the old total price. And then here outside of the loop, once we are done calculating the total price, I'll access my PDF doc, output some text here, and that text will be total price, dollar sign, and then simply total price like this. With all that, let's save that. And let's click on invoice for the second order. And here I get my invoice, which looks like this. Now, of course, we can also revert the font size here by setting font size to, let's say, 14, so that we don't use that super big font for all our text. So now by adding this line inside our loop, I ensure that this looks like that. And then maybe just some stylistic thing, though it will not become super pretty, I can add maybe some more dashes here to separate the list from the total price and set the font size of that total price a bit bigger to maybe 20. Save that. Reload. And here it is. Now, obviously, this is not the most beautiful invoice we ever saw. And you can learn way more about how you may style that in the official docs of PDF Kit. The important thing is the data in there is correct. So the data does look correct. The total price is correct. And this is how you can generate data on the fly and how you can then return it in a response and also save it in a file because that is important too. We do both in the same step. And I believe it's very interesting to see which power Node.js has and what you can do with it, especially when also playing around with the features of writable and readable streams, like here, where we are creating a PDF on the fly and we're streaming it both into a file and back to the client. Now in this module, we covered a lot and we work with files a lot. Now, one thing you might notice is that whenever we, for example, change an image or when we delete a product, the file belonging to that product, the image belonging to the product sticks around. Now, obviously, you can always delete files with the file system package. There, you also got options for deleting files. You could delete files whenever you edit a product, when you overwrite the image. So here, if we are inside that if block and we set a new image URL, then we could also kick off a function that goes ahead and deletes the old image by fetching that from the product first, because we're fetching the product here. So we can get access to the old image path by fetching that path and then using the file system to delete that old image. And we can, of course, also delete the image when we delete um, the product. So let's add this functionality as a last step now. And for that, I will go to my util folder and add a file, JS file, where I will add some helper functionality. There I'll import the file system. So the file system is imported here. And I'll have a constant which holds a function, which I'll name delete file. This function should accept the file path. And that's it, let's say. In here, I can use the file system package. And there you'll have the unlink method. It deletes the name and the file that is connected to the name. So it deletes a file at this path. So here I pass file path. And then this has the callback we know with an error if it fails. And in here, we can simply check if we got an error, then I want to throw it again. And then it should bubble up and our default express error handler should be able to take over. Otherwise, I'll not do anything here. So it's like a method I can always call to pass in a file path and delete that file. And now we can use that in our admin controller. 
So let me import my file helper here by requiring it from the util folder and there the file file. And now I can use that file helper, for example, in the place where we added a product, if we are in this if block and we know we'll replace the image URL, then before I do so, I will use file helper and uh, call my, my function there for that I need to export it though. So in here, I want to export delete file. This will hold my delete file constant. So this function. And now in the admin.js controller, here I can call file helper delete file and I pass in product image URL. So that path to that file. And now this should fire. I'm not waiting for this to complete. Um, I continue with my other operations. I'm doing this in a fire and forget manner. So I'm firing this function and I don't care about the result. If I wanted to, I would have to pass my callback here. So a function which then continues with the rest in this function here. But I simply fire it like this. And I will do the same when we delete a product. So in there, when we do delete it here, I also want to delete um, the respective image. And for that, I first of all need to fetch my product, of course. So I will have find by ID in here, find it by prod ID. And then here I have then and catch. In catch, I can next any error I get. And in the then block, I will have access to my product. So here I can then execute my file helper. I should of course also check if product is not set, in which case I'll also return next with a new error product not found. And otherwise I delete that. And I should only trigger delete one here after I found this. Otherwise we have a race condition where deleting could finish before finding is finished and that would be bad. So we'll grab that delete one code move that in here and return it to return the promise returned by delete one. And then I can actually replace that catch block with my old then and catch block. And this will catch errors in any of the then blocks. And it will also make sure that I first find the product. Once I found it, I delete the image and I simultaneously start deleting the product itself. Let's save all of that and let's see if that works. If I go back to admin products here and I delete product one. This is cleared and here I also have one image less. If I delete the second product, it's only three images. So this works. The other images are still sticking around because previously when I started deleting products and so on, I did not have that logic in place. But now this works, fetching my invoice or generating it on the fly works. And thanks to the fact that we store a snapshot of that in the database, it even works after the product was deleted, which is of course the way we want it to work. With that, we have a really nice setup here. Now, one last adjustment I wanna make is that I want to go into my views real quick and fix the placement of my invoice link in the orders EJS file. There I have that invoice link next to every product. That is incorrect, of course. It should be next to the order. So next to the order ID, I will have my invoice link so that now if I reload that orders page, I have that link up there, which makes more sense logically. But the behavior, of course, didn't change. That's it for this module. You learned a lot about files. You learned how to add file upload functionality, both in the form and then most importantly on the back end by using Malter, this nice middleware, which automatically extracts files from incoming requests and stores them as specified by us and which also is able to filter out um, certain file types if we want to. You learned how to store files both for adding and editing items, so how to manage that. And you of course also learned how to download files how to serve them statically with the help of that static middleware Express.js ships with. 
and how to make sure that this uses the right path. And alternatively, or depending on your requirements, how you can serve files as a response in a route, like with get order here in the shop.js controller, where we saw multiple different options of serving a file that already existed, for example, by loading it into memory and then returning it, or that you could stream such a file instead, or that you can even generate files on the fly if required, depending on what your application requirements are. And with that, you'll learn a lot of things about how to work with files, with streams, with responses, and this hopefully helps you implement file-related features into your next application.